will receive a copy of the recording of this webinar via email. You can ask questions at any time by using the questions tab in the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. And if you experience any trouble with sound, we recommend you exit the webinar and then log back in again. Now I'd just like to give a brief introduction to the topic and the webinar panelists. Today's webinar is called What's Driving Chinese Investment into Mining? If it wasn't for China, our industry would be a fraction of what it is today. It goes without saying that the rise of China has significantly impacted the mining industry over the last 20 years. It now consumes over half the world's commodities, as high as 70% in the case of iron ore. The purpose of this panel is to understand the investment machine that is China, understand the different aspects of what makes the, the, the cogs of that machine turn, and hopefully by the end we should have all learned about how to best tap into Chinese investment. To debate some of the issues involved, we are joined by Lim Twitter, Chief Executive Officer of PCF Capital Group. Lim has over 30 years of experience in the fields of investment banking and corporate finance. After starting his career as a professional footballer with Swindon Town in the UK, working in the 80s for corporate raiders, Robert Combs, Holton and Alan Bond. In 1994, Lear moved into investment banking and established uh, Macquarie Bank's Bullion and Commodities Division in Perth. In 1997, Lear was recruited to head up Bankers Trust investment banking activities in Western Australia. Following the sale of Bankers Trust Australia in 1999, Lear became a founding principal of PSF Capital Group, a Western Australian-based corporate advisory and investment banking business. He's also chairman of Minds Online, executive chairman of Future Gold, and a non-executive uh, non -executive director of Gold Corporation, the Perth Mint, and a non-executive uh, director of Soul Gold. Greg Pan, Chief Executive Officer of Hanking Industrial, Executive Officer and Executive Director of Chinese Hanking Holdings Limited. Mr. Pan has served as the President of Geosite Inc. And, is, and, and China General Manager of Goldfields China. Greg has obtained more than a 20 years experience in the operations and management of mining companies. He's published papers and reports in the areas of mining exploration, mining engineering, mining reserve estimates, economic evaluation and resource modeling. And our third panelist is Andrew Monk, Chief Executive Officer of BSA Capital. Andrew has 30 years experience in the city, working at Hall Government ABM AMRO for 11 years, before founding Oreo and Securities for the backing of the, of the Vital Group, and then becoming CEO of Blue Oil PLC. strong relations with many institutional investors in London and Asia. Andrew acquired BSA Capital in 2010, and has repositioned BSA as a leading investment bank for both companies, having a unique focus on taking Western companies to China. So let's uh, set the scene with a few opening general uh, questions. And firstly, if I could uh, turn to yourself, Greg, what are the key trends that you've seen over, over the past 15 years in the demand for commodities in China? Thank you, Andrew. Uh, <clears throat> yes, so, uh, you know, I really appreciate it very much, the, the, uh, this opportunity uh, to participate this, uh, in a panel. And we are talking about a very important topic here. And uh, let me just uh, very quickly uh, give you my idea for this uh, number, uh, very first question. Uh, I think everybody knows that China started reform about, uh, you know, in the 1970s, exactly should be 1978. China had aggressively implemented the door opening policies. So over the past four decades, China has achieved spectacular economic success with a near double figure GDP growth on average, uh, albeit the economy has slowed down somewhat in the recent years. So it is this uh, unprecedented economic growth and provide a driving force for fast growth in consumption of various mineral commodities. So the Chinese appetite on mineral products is so big that it has served almost as a single driving factor for the very fast expansions of mineral, uh, mineral industry you know, globally. So I don't see any other nation can even compare with Chinese impact on this industry in the world. So I'm very sure that dominant role China plays will continue for another decade at least. Uh, you know, when we talk about the trend of the, uh, 
of the uh, you know China has been an appearance in the past uh, you know 15 years or 20 years. You know, so we will, you know you know I just give you some a few numbers here. Uh, for example, among 42 major energy and mineral resources, there are 32 minerals in the Chinese consumptions is in the first place, you know, uh, globally. And five minerals are, are in the second place, and five minerals are in third place. So the Chinese consumption per capita of this 34 minerals exceeded the world average given the huge population base. And also, there are also 11 minerals that the Chinese consumption is 40 to 50 percent of the world total. So that's including the, uh, you know, like the, uh, you know, Yeah, okay. Um, I think we're having some problems here that Greg is just uh, slightly having some slight uh, AV problems. So while we just sort that out, I'm just going to probably just jump to the next panelist there, uh, Andrew. Um, Andrew, throughout your career, you've uh, built up numerous uh, broken corporate finance firms, most recently that at uh, BSA, where your head office is in uh, Shanghai. It's probably fair to say that the success of these firms has uh, been has has been on the commodity uh, investment boom generated by China, raising money as well as advising on M and A. Can you tell us a little bit about why you set up an office in China and what have you experienced on the deal flow side? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, the reason we set up an office in China was because China is so important for the commodities industry, and when you can't my view, really be in the commodities industry without certainly having an understanding of China, but really you need access to it because it is such an important part of the industry. Um, setting up an office in China is not easy. Uh, it's taken me a long, long time, but I, I started our office in Shanghai three years ago. Uh, and I always say to everybody, if you want to go into China, listen to how I did it. And it's a slightly longer story, but um, basically my office is all Chinese. Effectively inside China, it is Chinese. It's simply um, that it's VSA capital and it's it's run on my sort of systems. Um, but you, you've got to be involved. Um, and I've actually now recently just signed a, a joint venture actually with um, South China Securities, which is a large Hong Kong brokerage company. It's listed, um, it's part of the South China Group, which is a, a major uh, group within uh, Hong Kong and China, spreading across numerous quoted companies. So we actually now have 10 offices across China and Hong Kong. So it's, I haven't started working them all yet, but we will have huge exposure. But China is, is vital. It's not easy, um, but it is the biggest consumer of, of commodities. And it's also, don't just think that they're going to invest in your company. They're also, for instance, a big equipment supplier. So we take companies to China, mining companies who are, who are looking for source equipment. You, you need to think of it in all sorts of ways. Uh, and also just be aware that in China, they do do things slightly differently from the West. So you have to go in there with a very different mindset of how you're trying to do business with these partners. Okay, thank you uh, for that. Turning to uh, Liam, can you tell us a little bit about how PSF Capital became involved in China and what partnerships you're currently involved in? Sure, look, thanks Andrew and hello to your listeners. Um, I guess everything that we produce mining wise in Australia ends up, you know, a fair chunk of it ends up uh, getting delivered into China. There's a huge vortex and updraft uh, in, into, into China. So you can't help if you're in the mining space in Australia, you can't help but eventually dealing with, with the Chinese. And 
following the GFC, that big crash in 2008, um, that coincided uh, with a $50 billion outbound investment boom into the Australian market by the Chinese. So we didn't initially feel the um, the effects of the GFC around 2008. It was sort of delayed for a few years and we had all this investment coming through. So we couldn't help being uh, involved uh, with a lot of our clients doing deals with the Chinese. And I think that experience was sort of checkered would be the kind of uh, thing I could say. It's um, it was a learning exercise for both groups. But more recently, uh, we formed the Golden Gateway Joint Venture um, with Zhao Jin, uh, the, the fourth largest gold company in, in China, as a partnership. And, and it's a conduit for capital uh, coming from China into the Australian market. And um, that's going really well. And that was formed, I think, last October. And uh, there's been a lot of activity. And we've just come back from Beijing. So we see if you're involved in the mining space in Australia, there's so much capital to uh, to be derived and and uh, investment to be had from China. It's the place. It's, it's the go-to place at the moment. Okay. Thank you very much for that, uh, Liam. So I think we're now going to bring up the uh, first poll of the day. Um, it should be coming up on our screens very, very shortly. Um, the poll is how optimistic are you about Chinese economic growth prospects for 2020? Uh, as you can see on the screen, you should have five op uh, options. Optimistic, quite optimistic, neutral, quite pessimistic or very pessimistic. So if you can kind of click and go and uh, vote in your poll, we'll kind of keep that open for the next uh, 60 seconds or so. Um, as I mentioned, um, whilst we're allowing that sort of like poll and allowing people to go and vote, um, as I mentioned to the attendees, please feel free to fill in your questions, send in your questions at any time. We've already had a couple of questions that have been sort of sent in. So um, one question that I'm going to ask to see whether either uh, Liam or uh, um, Andrew is able to answer. We're having a few questions about palladium and rhodium and who in China is driving demand for palladium and rhodium. Um, I don't know whether Liam or Andrew, you'd, you'd actually better help the listeners with your views on that. Andrew, do, do you want to respond? Or I've got uh, my, my initial, uh, you, you go first, mate. Well, my, my initial response is I'm fairly surprised that the demand is so strong because obviously with EVs, um, there's a big change in the demand for those sort of, of metals. But uh, again, the whole world is, is redeveloping so it could well be that I'm, I'm missing something but also they're fairly interchangeable but prices at the moment of um, well platinum palladium and rhodium all to a certain extent are interchangeable yet they're all having very very different prices as well um, so it's a slightly confusing market and I, I, I'm not sure the picture is totally clear so it's, it's quite a tricky one to answer I mean again Liam I don't know if you know more no, and they're very thin markets too, so it doesn't take a lot of activity to shift the price. So uh, I'm also cautious. Uh, it's not not like gold or copper, which are, deals with big volumes. They're not great markets, so I'd be a little cautious. But I think there's certainly been a good uptick, and I think it's uh, you know connected to this improvement in growth outlook in China. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. I would be cautious. I think you could quite easily see them come back down again. Mm. Okay. Um, Make me thanks, sir. I think we can go and uh, close the poll now and perhaps just uh, get the results of the uh, first poll of the day up on the screen. Um, so I think as we see, I think that uh, I think 46 percent of the audience were neutral, 38 percent were quite optimistic, and 11 percent were very optimistic. Um, Five percent were quite pessimistic, and then, uh, then none of you were. Um, very pessimistic, which I think is all sort of like um, uh, good to hear. Um, I'm just kind of curious, Liam and Andrew, um, how optimistic are you about the economic growth prospects for China for 2020? Uh, Andrew, I'll go first. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. I mean, I think, again, talking about economic growth in China is always a slightly dry area because you never know quite what's real and what is um, the statistics put out. Um, certainly in the last, in 2019, because of the US trade war, um, some of the companies I've been going to visit have, have really been struggling, to be honest with you. It has really hurt them. Despite the statistics that are coming out, I would say the statistics aren't necessarily reflecting it. But of course, you are seeing this change in China from as international growth to domestic growth. Um, so again, that's a case you can't really describe economic growth in China quite as a simple one question. Um, look, it looks as though we're starting to sort out the trade deal. Um, I think there's a signing today um, of some form. Um, and I guess that with Trump trying to get re-elected, it's, it's going to carry on getting a little bit better, although there's still going to be a, a little bit of, and I put this in inverted commas, a cold war between the US and, and China. Um, so I think that the, the growth in China will be okay. 
Um, but I certainly wouldn't say very optimistic. Um, I think neutral probably is, as the audience have said, is, is the right answer. Um, but it will be very much stimulated by China doing things to make domestic growth and the domestic economy growing very fast rather than the sort of international and export market. Mm -hmm. okay. If I could jump in there, uh, Andrew, um, the sentiment mm -hmm. that, that we're experiencing as a result of the trade war is that we, we get the impression that the Chinese never ever want to be caught like the way they have been caught um, with this trade war. And even if it gets resolved amicably, they want to make sure they've got the supply line sort of outside the, the sort of North American influence. So Australia's um, been a real beneficiary of that. So despite, you know, hopefully they'll resolve this trade war and, and the trade flows continue. But I think once bitten twice shy, the Chinese never want to get caught like that. So I think Australia will be a net beneficiary of that in terms of supplying services and, and minerals into the Chinese as, a, as an alternative path. Okay. So um, let's kind of like move on to the subjects of state-owned and uh, non-state-owned uh, uh, enterprises in China. There are two types of big mining investors in China. Those are the state-owned and those are the not. Um, so let's explore, aside from the obvious, what are the real differences between the two? So perhaps if I turn to yourself, um, uh, Andrew, with regards to state-owned and non-state-owned enterprises, do they look for different things, and, and if so, what? And for example, is one more strategic than the other? Um, I seeking supply rather than seeking equity returns. Um, look, there, there is a difference. I'll be honest with you. We deal nearly entirely with the non-state-owned, i.e., the, the POEs. Um, but that's purely because of the size of our business and, and our reach. Uh, and you, you tend to find it's the um, the Goldman Sachs and the JP Morgans of this world that are dealing with the SOEs. Uh, we're, we're mainly based in Shanghai, which tend to have more POEs, whereas the, the SOEs tend to be off in Beijing. Um, so yes, look, the SOEs are more strategic. The uh, POEs can be more flexible. Often they've got money offshore for whatever reason, but ultimately China as a, a nation still has a directive and no one likes to go against the director of the um, Chinese government. So you can run into exactly the same issues that you think you've got a deal done. You're 99% of the way there. And for whatever reason, the chairman has perhaps been tapped on the shoulder by a government official and said, I don't think we should do that deal. And the whole deal falls apart. So, um, you know, you do have to be very aware of that. And you do have to have a very good understanding of what director of the Chinese government is and it, it can change from time to time as well so I think again the reason when I when I introduced myself slightly I pointed out that all my office are local Chinese and one of the reasons you've got to have that is because they understand these sort of flows and how these companies work and it, it's quite complex even if you spent 25 years in China understanding some of the ways that the Chinese work so I, I think that they are different but to a certain extent, when you're you're thinking about them, I would say treat them almost the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the um, do we have uh, Greg Pan back online? No, I'm here. I'm here, Andrew. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. We managed to get Greg sort of uh, back online from China, Hanking. Um, oh, like Craig, obviously with your sort of like your sort of your experience of China and your experience of state-owned and non-state-owned uh, enterprises. In your opinion, what do um, uh, state-owned and non-state-owned enterprises in China look for when they are looking to invest? Uh, you mean the SOEs versus? Yeah, I think, the, yeah, I think uh, both the SOEs uh, and also the non-SOEs in your experience. Oh, okay, okay, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know I think, uh, yeah, you know, they are quite different companies. Uh, SOEs, uh, you know, as uh, you know, Andrew and Lim already talked about, that uh, usually you know it's owned by the government so this has a significant uh, you know, advantage over the poes or private owned in getting supports from the chinese uh, uh, let's say banks and other state-owned uh, financial you know, organizations and also uh, they have much better the internal loan than, uh, so, uh, um, I think I, I, I think sorry, Greg. I think we still have some problems with you. Uh, so I think while um, I'd like to turn to 
yourself, Liam. Um, in terms of the Chinese, uh, in terms of the Chinese SOEs and the non SOEs, can you talk a little bit about how active they are in their investments? Perhaps you can go and give us some examples. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, just to echo Andrew Monk's comments that uh, whether they're private or state-owned enterprise, there's got to be an alignment with government strategy. And uh, if there's not alignment there, you can get yourself in hot water. The main difference we found is the, is the speed uh, and nimbleness of private operators versus uh, a state-owned enterprise. Certainly in Australia, if you're dealing with an SOE, you need um, foreign investment review board approval, and that can be that can take quite a while to get through just to check through that you know the lines that go through to the SOE. So some companies. Whilst you've got some state-owned enterprise and some private groups, there are some groups that, in fact, have something like a 30% stake um, via a, a state-owned enterprise. So that creates a level of complexity. So when you're dealing with them, um, if you're running a competitive sale process or an auction, which is quite often the way when people are doing deals in Australia, that certainly doesn't suit an SOE because of the amount of due diligence and approvals that they require. It generally can, can frustrate a sale process. Compared with the private operators, we were involved uh, more recently with the Alita Lithium um, Administration. That's a, a lithium company that's, that's gone bust. And a China, this is in the public domain, and the Chinese group came through. Uh, China Hydrogen uh, Energy is, is the public um, is, the, is the company that uh, is in the box seat, and they went from start to finish in 30 days. Uh, it's, a, it's a deal in the tens of millions. It's still to be approved by the court, but uh, in contrast with dealing with an, an SOE, which would probably take six months if, if you know if you're lucky, um, the private groups can move unbelievably quickly. So we found that as, as, as a major difference. And when you try to sell an asset and bring in a Chinese party, if it's a state-owned enterprise, you just need to manage your timelines and everyone's expectations. Okay, thank you very much for that. And uh, I think that with that, let, let's probably move on from uh, SOEs and non-SOEs and move on to the second poll of uh, today's webinar, which will be shortly getting up on the screen now. But do you expect Chinese investment abroad into mining to increase in 2020? So do you expect it to significantly increase, uh, as in by 25% and, and more, slightly increase, no change, slightly decrease, significantly decrease? The poll is now open now for the next uh, couple of minutes. So if you'd like to all go and vote, and then we'll go and uh, discuss those uh, results. Um, whilst we go and um, obviously uh, allow the audience to vote, uh, perhaps I can ask a question to yourself, Andrew, about Chinese investing uh, abroad. Um, it's become more common in recent years to see Chinese companies setting up offices ab uh, abroad, such as in London, Toronto, Vancouver, etc. I assume that they're doing this in order to get closer to the deal flow. However, in, in your experience, does this uh, help better engage with Chinese investors? Is it more effective to be burning shoe leather on the on on the uh, streets of uh, Beijing or Shanghai? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that from I mean, look, there's one overriding thing you always have to bear in mind when dealing with China, which is certainly different from the West, and that is that the ultimate decision in China is always done by the chairman. Uh, we're used to in the West, you know, a board of directors doing it. And if you approach a Western company, you go and talk maybe with the finance director and he can get on and, and make the decisions in China. It just doesn't work like that. Unless the chairman says, yes, you ain't got a deal. Um, so in that respect, the chairman will know who we sit in China. So having an overseas office doesn't particularly help uh, and again you know we find let's take that a name a lot of people know someone like Foson Foson have an office in London but I hardly ever go into their office in London and often go into their office in Shanghai um, so really they're I wouldn't say they're particularly helpful in in terms of getting a deal done um, because it's done back in China um, but you know they're they're obviously there as a way of talking to them and in that respect it saves shoe leather but again I, I, would, I would repeat without one to repeat myself rather you know because we have an office in Shanghai and say so now we actually have 10 offices across China the best way of getting a deal done is having a China Chinese person talking to a Chinese person so you know I, I would say that actually these overseas offices don't really help us particularly in terms of doing deals but that, that's my experience you know Liam you may say something different in Australia the market in Australia is slightly different from the market in London because Australia is in the same time zone. Australia is made of commodities and it is China's sort of backyard. So, you know, that I'm ex describing my experience. 
we, 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 I, I echo your, your, your sentiment. And I guess in, in Australia and probably in the Western world, you're used to board of directors having sort of joint and several liability and everyone's got to be on board and the chair plays a key role. But in China, it's uh, once the chairman's made his decision, other people fall into line or other directors might feel, well, he's made a decision. No, there's no liability on me. So it's getting your head around that and that then gravitates you towards making sure you've got a good connection with, uh, with the respective chairman. So um, uh, that's, uh, that's certainly, certainly the case. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so perhaps actually we can now just uh, close the poll and perhaps we can go and uh, go to the poll and just see what the results of the poll were. I think it's going to be overwhelming. Uh, I don't think that the investment, I think Chinese investment abroad into mining will slightly increase in uh, 2020. Um, I think probably just turning back to yourself sort of like Liam, could have like from your experience, you know, globally, where have Chinese investors been making the most recent mining investment positions? Yeah, look, it's look. I, I think gold and copper seem to loom large, and and lithium. Um, and just when we saw that first massive wave of Chinese investment in, into the Australian market, and uh, as I said, it was about fifty billion. Um, they most of that got blown up. Um, coming and buying, paying 100%, acquiring assets. Um, um, I, I think that I sense a change in their strategy. Um, I see interest in taking equity stakes and I see a lot stronger interest in joint ventures. And um, I know we've just seen Zijin come in with a bid for Continental Gold and the bid for 100%, but I, I think they're a little more confident and a little more sophisticated and have been operating overseas for a longer period of time. But more of the Chinese groups that we see, rather than have 100% of something and overpay, they'd rather have, say, 50% or 40%. We'll it, yeah, in, in mining deals, this is you know, so a joint venture and where they share the upside and get to know the local conditions before piling mm -hmm. in. So we're seeing more interest in joint ventures and in terms of the commodities, I mean, they're, they're interested in most commodities, but we're certainly we're seeing gold, copper and lithium um, um, at, at the top of the, uh, of the run at the moment. Okay. And I think this yourself, Andrew, would you have anything to sort of like add to that in terms of what sort of uh, mining deals from your experience? Do Chinese investors particularly favour? Um, well, I, I would echo what Liam says. Gold and copper is definitely on the Chinese list. I mean, the Chinese tend to, they, they sort of all go in the same way, partially because it's government directive. And I mean, we joke in London about the Chinese shopping list because every every investment bank in China has the same shopping list. Um, and at the moment, gold and copper are definitely at the top of that list. I think lithium, which was hot a few years ago, um, has been cold actually for a while, but I think it's probably about to start going back again. Um, and I think probably we will see in the next 18 months, all of the battery metals coming back into favor again. They all, they all blew up too much a few years back and the prices went through the roof and Chinese backed right off. Um, so, but I think they will come back in for those. Um, I mean, I think again, asking a question, you know, Chinese investment abroad, will it increase? It's a very wide question that, isn't it? And it'll vary depending upon different metals, different regions. I, I, again, I think that there, at the moment there is quite a big policy in China to try and keep the money inside China to stimulate the domestic economy. So I, I personally would say it probably won't increase much, but it is very specific. Um, so if you're in copper and gold at the moment, that's, that's, you want to be walking around China. Um, there's obviously like a lot of talk about the Belt and Road initiative. I was wondering if any of our panelists, um, you know, have any thoughts about how our Chinese investors looking to capitalise on the Belt and Road initiative and, and how that may sort of like pan out, pan out over the next sort of one to five years. Yeah, it's I'll a fairly it broad. So go, go for on, it, Andrew. Go. go for it, mate. No, no. Oh, you go. That's fine. Okay. Well, look, it's a fairly broad initiative, and I think strategically, if any Chinese party can link the acquisition back to where it fits in that Belt and Road and that you know that global trading route and and that, that overall ambition, um, I think they're more likely to get the strategic sign-off from from the government. So it's a fairly broad uh, plan, and um, and most things can fit into it. So uh, and you know whether it's in Africa and uh, that, you know we've seen it. Uh, just about every everything can fit. It's a broad church, I think, and um, anyone that's smart can link their their acquisition or deal back into that initiative with a view to getting a, an internal or government sign off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, okay. I'd agree. With that. Um, I, do you have I'd any thoughts on uh, Belton Road? Yeah, I mean, I basically agree with that. I, mean, I think the Belton Road policy is is not as 
uh, pushed quite as hard as it used to be by the Chinese government. They're, they're now focusing a lot on, on what's known as the GBA, the Greater Bay Area, which isn't really commodity focused particularly. But I think that Liam says if you're on the Belt and Road, you've got a much better chance of, of getting a deal done. And I think uh, if you look again at the sort of continents, Africa, which you know is on the Belt and Road, although it's theoretically just East Africa, is still a very popular place for the Chinese to go and and look for commodity deals. Um, we actually also have an office in Johannesburg, um, so uh, we see still a huge amount of, of potential business between Africa and China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another question just to throw out to the panelists is. Um, at a recent Minds and Money London show, ESG was a hot topic. Um, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just turn to sort of like Greg first to see if we've got him back online. But um, how important is ESG to Chinese investors? Okay, I don't think we have got Greg back online. So perhaps I can ask that question of how important is ESG to Chinese investors to Andrew? Um, probably most people would be surprised i think actually it's becoming increasingly important um a lot of people think that china doesn't care but there is quite a big move i find at the moment in china for trying to be better at esg and so i think you will see it coming up more and more um admittedly from a pretty low base to be honest with you but again what i would say to a lot of people is that um if you look at uh, this whole, what I describe as transitional energy space, which is, you know, cleaning up, instead of lots of diesel engines driving the mines, putting in, you know, solar panels and battery storage, what actually drives it is not so much everybody saying that we've got to save the planet, uh, but it's economics. Uh, and the real key at the moment is that the economic sort of point for moving from fossil fuels to renewable energy, um, we're going through that critical point, and now it is actually becoming cheaper to actually run a mine using renewable energy and batteries because the, the price of batteries and the efficiencies of them and the sorts has, has, has got there basically. You can now just about do it. So I think you will actually see, uh, again, from a very low base, uh, a much more ESG type consumer and that does include China, yes, because there is an initiative from the government to, to be more ESG. If I could chip in there, and it's probably um, we're seeing more on the E than the S and G. Um, you know, with the air quality in China, um, the the environment side is, is is important. And anyone, any Chinese uh, group that are looking at being active in in Australia or North America, that getting the environmental permits is becoming increasingly difficult. And that's a, against a backdrop, probably the first time in the world we've ever had a major industry, being coal thermal coal industry, being put on notice that they're going out of business. So we've never ever seen something like that. It might take a few years, but uh, there's been a massive push, and you can't uh, ignore it. You know, the, the bushfires in Australia again have sort of um, brought up the, the, this whole, um, you know, climate change issue, and environment looms large. So the social and governance side, I mean, that that is important, but I think e um, no one you could be anywhere on the planet and not be aware of the issues now with the environment and climate change, the impact that's going to have on your investment. Okay. Um, I think in the remaining sort of like 10 minutes or so we've got left, I'd like now to, to move on to the topic of uh, Hong Kong. Um, we actually have our upcoming Minds and Money Asia show taking place from the 31st of March to the 1st of April. And then we also have a day on the 2nd of April in uh, Shenzhen this year. Um, turning to yourself first, um, Andrew, in your view, how important is Hong Kong now for sourcing Chinese investors compared to, say, five years ago? um you know like hong kong is important it's it's quite easy to sometimes get quite negative and even i get quite negative sometimes what what's going on and one has to be able to be very careful what one says um but at the end of the day um one of the big elephant in the room when you're dealing with china is is the movement of capital um and you can have a great deal and you can have a company that really wants to do it but if they can't get the money out of china then you can't do it it's as simple as that so clearly hong kong you have free movement of capital um, so, you know, one of the first things we look at when we're trying to do a deal with a Chinese person is, you know, are they listed in Hong Kong? Have they got a subsidiary in Hong Kong uh, or elsewhere in the world so that we can actually get the money that they're saying they're going to pay for a, a mine, get it actually out of China. So Hong Kong is important. Now, really, you know, where the future goes with Hong Kong is, is definitely somewhat up for debate. And again, just bringing in the Greater Bay Area, I think, you know, China is clearly is that program thinking about 
you know where Hong Kong sits within the Greater Bay Area, and is is that going to change? And probably over the next ten years, there will be a, some sort of a change because the Chinese are not, shall we say, known for their patience with putting up with issue places like Hong Kong, and we'll probably then change the rules slightly to, to get around it. Um, but we'll have to wait and see on that. But yeah, look, at the moment, Hong Kong is still a very important portal for flows of capital. Mm -hmm. um, Liam, the top three Chinese mining companies, China Shenhua Energy, China Coal Energy, and Zijin Mining, are of course all listed in Hong Kong. Do you think uh, Hong Kong's will uh, uh, purpose as a uh, purpose as a location for listing Chinese largest mining companies would change given the current wave of pro democracy? Look, you know, possibly. Uh, I think it's uh, it provides a good window into the appetite for investment in mining companies um, in, in in broader China. Um, where Hong Kong goes, look, you know, I, I don't know. But we were looking at the valuations of the best Australian um, gold companies and the best North Americans, and they're both trading at the at the better end, around six times. Uh, sort of an earnings multiple. And then when we looked at their peers on the Chinese exchanges and also looking at those on Shenzhen and, and Shanghai, albeit that the, the companies might be a little bit smaller, but they're sort of double. Um, they're like 12, some of them are 20 times earnings. So there's a limited supply of, uh, of, of investment opportunities. And those that are there, I think, are getting very well valued. And pools of capital for junior companies um, in North America and Australia is still pretty tight. But I sense there's a huge opportunity coming um, out of out of Asia and uh, out, out of Shenzhen and Shanghai, not necessarily Hong Kong. I mean, Hong Kong, you've got to be a pretty sizable group with a good history to, uh, to get up on the Hong Kong exchange. But if we can find a way to get Western capital or Western companies to, to list or dual list on some of those other exchanges, um, that could could be the, the, the third big pool or the fourth big pool. Obviously, you've got the UK as well and uh, you know their support for, for mining companies. But I sense that there could be an appetite. Now, and I've seen that within the state-owned enterprises with the maybe people behind those companies seeing the impact that they have on one of these bigger exchanges. But if they get behind some of the, the shells or smaller vehicles on the Shenzhen and Shanghai exchange, there might be scope for them to get direct equity and a lot more leverage. And the commercialization of that Chinese mining experience and listing experience um, on the big exchanges now coming through to Shanghai and Shenzhen and might open a whole world of opportunity. So I'm pretty, pretty optimistic. Where Hong Kong goes, I, look, I'm not sure, Andrew, and I'm probably not qualified enough to say, but it's, uh, uh, it's difficult at the moment, but it may well get resolved. But I'm probably more optimistic on Shanghai and Shenzhen and some of these other exchanges because I do sense China's looking to open up and commercialise uh, its capital markets. I mean, just, just one um, small point, sorry, Andrew, one small point that people might not be aware of, but I, I find it quite interesting. It's, it's very easy to be negative on Hong Kong. Hong Kong market actually had more IPOs last year in 2019 than any other market around the world. So it's not completely dead and buried. I was sorry, Andrew, and I didn't mean to pass the aspersions on, on Hong Kong. I'm, I'm not close enough <laughs> uh, you know, to that, but, uh, but that, that's fabulous. And, and I wish it every, uh, every success and continued su success. No, by the way, I wasn't think, saying you were at all, and I, I can be quite negative on Hong Kong, but I just find it fascinating, actually, that with all this going on, you know, with all the protests, actually, we're still having yeah. more IPOs than any other market. A little bit of that, I think, well, that's... Liam, you, you mentioned that it's still tight in Australia. It's, it's still very tight in London. But the London capital markets are very tricky still at the moment. Well, we, we used to have 30 to 40 IPOs, exploration IPOs a year in the Australian market. I think last year we had two. I think Canada would have a similar number last year. It may have had three. And it's been like that for the last two or three years. So there's a there's a complete shift away from sort of juniors to the to the bigger companies. Um, but I sense that, that there is an opportunity for the best of breed of those juniors to maybe do something in uh, in China. Okay. Um, I think in the final sort of ten minutes, I'm just going to uh, ask some the questions that have been sent in from the audience. And apologies for the audience, we've had over about thirty or so questions sent in, so we can't answer them all. I'm just going to pick the most sort of popular sort of uh, three or four, and we'll see. Um, and we'll just go and cover those. There's been quite a few questions about uh, the US and China tensions. So perhaps I'll just um, ask a question to yourself, Liam. Um, what has been the impact of the heightened trade tensions between the USA and China and the resulting reduced demand seen by Chinese companies on Chinese investments into mining? Look, I've seen it being a net beneficiary of being Australian companies. So the Chinese, I wouldn't say were blindsided, but because these tensions with and tariffs have been going for a period of time with Trump, but having been caught uh, the way they have been, 
um, they won't want to be caught like that again. So they are deliberately looking at moving around um, you know, uh, the, the USA. And in fact, the USA are moving outside um, China as well with our strategic minerals. So um, Australia's worked out quite well. It's probably not good for, gro for global GDP, but I'm sure it will get resolved and that they'll, they'll come up with a, a deal um, given it's an election year for Trump uh, coming up. But um, I, I think it's, it's um, been a lot of huff and puff and uh, a deal will get done. And I, I think if you're not in the US or China, places like Australia, I think we're a net beneficiary of this trade, trade tension. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew, we talked a little bit earlier about Africa and obviously that you have uh, that uh, VSA Capital have an office in Johannesburg. A couple of questions have been sent in about Africa, so I'm going to try to combine two of the, two of the questions. Is, is about what is the initiative goal for Chinese to invest in Africa? What is the strategic um, um, uh, uh, what is the strategic aim for Chinese investors? And then also a follow up question is is there any linkage between the construction of the dam in Ethiopia and Chinese interest in African mineral resources? Uh, I mean, again, it, that's a very some very broad questions there, and Africa is a huge continent. Um, with a lot of different countries within it with different uh, political allegiances. Um, but I think, you know, Africa is, as like Australia, is, is just full of very high quality natural resources. So uh, that's the starting point. It's a place to go if you want natural resources because they're such good qualities at high grade and, and economic as well in general. Um, I think on top of that, you know, Africa needs Chinese investment to a certain extent. Now it's had some bad experiences. Um, I think it's fairly well known that, you know, a lot of people feel the Chinese came in and put a huge amount of debt into some of these countries uh, with a view that it can never be paid back, to, they can then effectively take control. Um, again, I think the Chinese, Liam said it earlier, the Chinese are learning uh, about investment and are changing their ways. Um, so it is a different world today. Um, but... Um, you know what the, what they really want, ultimately what all the chinese investors in mining want is, is they want the, the actual commodity itself so they're investing really for the production to get the offtake um but then they're also interested in in potentially as i said earlier um supplying the equipment because they can make a good margin on that supplying their own their equipment for mining equipment to go to these mines we've just taken a a, a company round literally last week round china looking for about uh, half a billion sterling of equipment to, to build their mine in africa uh, and had a tremendous reception. Um, so, you know, I think Africa is always going to be there, just as Australia is. Wherever there are a lot of good quality resources, the Chinese will be there. They have to be. In terms of the dam and and, and Ethiopia, I mean, that, that comes back to the other question: is that clearly big infrastructure projects will always be of interest to the Chinese because they feel number one they're good at doing them, number two um, they can do them very cheaply and efficiently. Uh, but number three, it gives them a very strong position with governments in countries. So whether that connects back necessarily to the commodities, I'm, I'm not so sure. I think that's a different uh, angle that we're taking. Okay. Um, a couple of questions were sent in about uh, junior exploration. So I'm going to again roll two questions up to yourself, Liam. Uh, do you see the potential for the emergence of the Chinese junior exploration sector? And then flipping it over, are the Chinese also looking to invest into junior public listed companies as well? Oh, look, taking the second one first, I think they are nervous. Um, and th there are, there's, there's a whole layer of, of juniors in the Australian market that might have a million ounce resource. In fact, around the globe, we counted, I think, 300 companies with a million ounce resource and a 30 mil market cap. Uh, that's a million ounces of, of gold. And just can't, they're stuck. They can't get funding to take themselves from where they are to a decision to mine. And, you know, where do they go? And I just sense the best of those might have an opportunity of doing, uh, doing something and attracting some Chinese capital. So I am optimistic. And I think given the huge volume of money and appetite for risk that there is within China, and it's just finding a way to get in with the right endorsements and the right blessings to get uh, companies through that they can dual list. I mean, Australian company can dual list in, uh, in, the, in the UK market, it can dual list in, in Canada, but I sense there may well be an opportunity to do that with the best of them up in China. In terms of a junior market, I, look, I'm, I'm not sure whether that's, that would be where I'd want to start. I'd rather get the best 10 
or the best, uh, you know, the best 20 Australian opportunities, maybe Canadian opportunities, and use those to, to try and see if they could raise capital and maybe have a secondary listing on a Chinese exchange and make sure they've got good management teams, good access, a, a good, um, good assets, and that they are successful. So I'm optimistic, and I think there'll be a, a fourth um, leg to the stool. So at the moment, you've got capital pools in the UK, Australia, and, uh, and uh, Canada for junior companies, but I think the emerging one is going to be the Chinese, and it's just working out how to play that and to make sure that it works um, because there'll be a flood of uh, players trying to raise money there if, if it does, and it's just making sure the first ones go well. Okay. Um, I think as we're just sort of like uh, running short of time now, I've just got just time for one closing question to both, and I'll probably ask it to Andrew first and then uh, Liam. So turning to yourself, Andrew, um, you, from your many years of experience, what's the single most important piece of advice you would give to our audience of investors, corporates and deal makers when it comes to attracting Chinese investment? Well, I guess I have to say, uh, come and talk to VSA, but um, joking apart, <laughs> um, we, we don't solve everybody's problems in the truth. Look, I think that the, the key advice is when you're dealing in China, uh, you have to think Chinese, you have to have a local partner to work with you. You can't do it as a foreigner or a guaylo as they're known. Um, you, you just won't get respect to the Chinese. You need a, a partner who is Chinese in China to be working for you so that you have a China to China conversation um, um, to get a deal done. So that, that's probably my best advice, followed by you know, you've got to get in with the German, otherwise you haven't got a deal. So those are the two keys. And uh, Liam? Yeah, look, um, absolutely, the chairman. Um, be, and because you've got that language barrier as well, and you, you've probably got an interpreter in, in between, and the interpreter's got to have a relationship with the chairman, but you've got to have that build up of trust. And the only way I think you can get a deal done and get that trust is to go to China. So to try and do it over the phone or, or meet with people in Australia or, or, or overseas, you'll get so far, but sooner or later, you've got to go to China, front the chairman and build that relationship. And, and the power of the chairman is, 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 is immense and it overpowers everyone else on the board. So you need to get that person um, behind the deal. So a face-to-face -face meeting with the, cha with the chairman and uh, to build that trust is um, paramount. So you won't do it sitting on your bum you know, in Australia. Okay. Um, so I think kind of with that, we're uh, out of uh, time. So uh, once again, a big thank you to Greg, Andrew and Liam. A big thank you to all of our listeners for uh, dialing in in our first webinar of the year. Um, we'll be having some more webinars uh, uh, coming up and we'll be sending you through details of those. We'll also be covering the topic of uh, China and Chinese investment in uh, greater detail at our upcoming Minds and Money Asia event that runs on the 31st of March, the 1st of April, with a day in Shenzhen on the 2nd of April, where uh, all the panelists that you heard today will all be uh, presenting. Um, all the listeners of this broadcast will also be entitled to a discount and the discount code is coming up on your uh, screens now. So we hope to go and see some of you at uh, Minds of Money Asia. Um, also, for more great uh, news and content, please check out our Mining Beacon webinar website at miningbeacon.com. Many thanks and see you again soon.